Good afternoon. The first item of business this afternoon is portfolio questions. And as ever, in order to get as many people in as possible, short and succinct questions and answers would be preferable. Question number one, Cameron Buchanan. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met representatives of the NHS boards, National Health Boards. Cabinet Secretary Alex Neil. Presiding officer, ministers and senior officials meet regularly with representatives of NHS boards to discuss issues of interest to the people of Scotland. Thank you. Thank Cabinet you, Buchanan. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Can the Cabinet Secretary confirm whether there have been any discussions regarding the use of robots in the surgical treatment of prostate cancer, following Prostate Cancer UK's highlighting that it can deliver better outcomes than other forms of surgery? Moreover, given that England has now 33 of these robots and Scotland none, can he advise why they are available in England but not in Scotland, when they will be available in Scotland, and what arrangements are in place to ensure that the Scots can use the English facilities on the NHS in the meantime? Cabinet Secretary. Well, Presiding Officer, there have been extensive discussions uh, on the use of robots in prostate operations, uh, particularly in the west of Scotland and indeed in the Grampian area. The National Planning Group is looking at this in great detail, including what lessons can be learned from America, where there is much, much more extensive use of robotic surgery. And it will report in due course, and I'll update the Parliament at that time. Thank you. Supplementary, Margaret McCulloch. When did the Scottish Government last meet Lanarkshire Health Board and have they received an update on the norovirus outbreak at Hare Myers, which has closed two wards and restricted places to patients in four and has also led patients being sent away and directed to Wishaw General? And if you have, can we also receive the update in the Chamber, please? Cabinet Secretary. The presenting Officer, we are in regular touch with NHS Lanarkshire about the very exceptional outbreak of norovirus, the extent of the outbreak of norovirus uh, in Hare Myers Hospital, which has uh, led to some disruption in terms of the provision of services. I have to say this is an unprecedented in scale uh, outbreak of norovirus in Hare Myers, and the action taken by NHS Lanarkshire has been about the safety of patients and indeed the saf safety of staff. I will ask NHS Lanarkshire to make sure that all Lanarkshire MSPs are updated as soon as possible on the current situation and kept up to date with any further changes. Thank you. Question number two, Sarah Boyack. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to address waiting time challenges in NHS Lothian. Cabinet Secretary Alec Neil. Presiding Officer, I am aware that the Board has been experiencing capacity difficulties delivering the waiting time target waiting time guarantee and standards. And that is why the Board has already indicated they will be investing over £8 million in the current year to increase capacity by recruiting around 80 full-time equivalent staff, including consultants, nurses and other clinical support staff and specialities such as ENT, opth ophthalmology and orthopaedics. This additional capacity will come on stream soon and should enable a significant reduction in waiting times over the coming months, with the 12 weeks legal treatment guarantee being delivered by the end of this year and the outpatient waiting time standard by March 2015. My officials will continue to work closely with the Board to support delivery of waiting times. Thank you, Sid Boyack. Can I thank the Minister for his uh, reply, and particularly the co commitment for his officials to work closely with NHS Lothian. Minister, the NHS Lothian struggles to meet the targets. It is one of the worst performers on both 18 and the 12 week targets and is currently spending £1.5 million on private procedures every month. Will the Minister accept that there has been a serious capacity problem despite the best efforts of the staff and that the sheer demand of patients needing treatment must be addressed to shift this resource into this area of NHS Lothian will inevitably impact on other areas? Is the Minister confident that NHS Lothian has the resources to meet the increasing demand and capacity that it is currently uh, challenged with meeting? Cabinet Secretary. Presenting officer, two points. I am absolutely confident they have the money to do that without adversely affecting other areas because there has been a real time increase in NHS Lothian's board this year and it will also get a real increase in its uh, budget for next year as well. Uh, can I say the fundamental problem uh, in NHS Lothian is particularly around Edinburgh 
where the capacity planning that was done 10, 12, 15 years ago grossly underestimated the growth in the population in Edinburgh by up to 20%. And as a result of that, NHS Lothian has had to invest in additional capacity in the Victoria and elsewhere to cope with the demand for day-to-day -day services as a result of that underplanning of capacity which happened in previous years. I'm absolutely confident they have a very workable plan that will be delivered. And as I say, by the end of this year, and I've always made this clear, by the end of this year, I expect NHS Lothian to, de to deliver the TTG for inpatients and by March next year the TTG for outpatients. Thank you. Question number three, Angus MacDonald. Yes, thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what action it's taken to promote healthy eating choices for children. Minister Michael Matheson. We are taking forward a range of activities to support children to eat a healthy balanced diet from nutritional standards for school meals to our £3 million food education fund to teach children about the food they eat and the impact it has on their health. Last week, I launched Beyond the School Gate, which offers guidance on how we can positively influence the food environment around schools. This builds upon the Better Eating, Better Learning, uh, which was published in March, uh, which sets out uh, refreshed guidance to support further improvements in school food and food education. Together, uh, these offer a holistic package uh, to help partners support children to make healthier choices both inside and outside school. And the First Minister also announced earlier this year that the entitlement to free school meals would be extended to all children in primary one to three from January 2015, thereby supporting the development of healthy eating habits for at a young age. Angus MacDonald. I thank the Minister for his reply and welcome the Scottish Government's recent uh, Beyond the School Gate announcement, amongst others. Um, clearly, it's important that local authorities do all, the, all that they can to ensure healthy options for children. Does the Minister share my disappointment, however, that the local authority which we share, Falkirk Council, has failed to sign up to previous initiatives such as Seafood in Schools, and will do all that he can to encourage Falkirk Council and others to embrace those healthy eating initiatives more positively? Minister. Well, I'm sure the member will recognise that uh, everyone has a part to play in trying to help to encourage uh, school children to eat a balanced diet and a healthy diet as best they can. And that includes uh, those within the retail sector, within local authorities, in particular education departments, uh, and also government and other agencies who can help to support in uh, achieving that. I am aware uh, that Falkirk Council have not proceeded with the, uh, uh, the Seafood in Schools uh, programme, which I uh, share his disappointment on, and I would encourage them to do so, uh, to reconsider this matter, because uh, encouraging children to eat seafood uh, is an important part of uh, having a balanced diet. And I think this was a very positive initiative uh, which uh, Falkirk Council could take forward. Thank you, Minister. Supplementary from Rhoda Grant. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Is the Minister aware of the responsible retailing of energy drinks campaign that has been recently endorsed by the EIS? Uh, the campaign in Scotland is led by Councillor Norma Austin Hart and seeks to encourage retailers not to sell energy drinks to children, building upon the ba la Scottish Labour's ban of the sale of these drinks within schools. Uh, consuming energy drinks means that children come to school often agitated, often unable to concentrate and learn, and can be disruptive in class and indeed the wider health implications are not really known. Retailers, especially those close to schools, are being asked not to sell these drinks to young people under the age of 16. I wonder if the Minister would now back this campaign to ensure that children come to school ready to learn and are not disruptive. Minister. So there are a number of important factors that have to be taken forward in trying to encourage uh, uh, school children to remain within the school environment for eating, and part of that is about the uh, type of food that is provided within schools. And there is a range of work that has been taken forward by local authorities to encourage uh, and achieve that. For example, the school that I visited just last week has saw a 40 per cent increase in the number of children who have remained in school to consume uh, food in schools because of the approach that they have actually taken. And the second part is to work with those retailers that are in close proximity to our school gates to look at what action they can take. And as set out in the guidance for local authorities, the measures that they can take for their own licensing, etc., in order to address some of these issues. So I think a combination of these factors are extremely important. And the issue about beyond the school gate, it's not just fizzy drinks, 
It is foods which are high in fat, sugar and salt that have a significant impact on the health of children. So we have to deal with all of these factors, not one in its own, uh, if we are going to try and deal with this issue in a comprehensive way. And our college and local authorities have a key role to play in helping to deliver that through the policies that they can take forward in a licensing form. Thank you. Question number four, Margaret Mitchell. Uh, thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what measures it is taking to combat malnutrition, which affects some of the most vulnerable older people. Cabinet Secretary Alec Neil. Presiding Officer, the Scottish Government is doing many things to tackle malnutrition for older people. £1.75 million since 2008 to improve nutritional care for older people, including malnutrition screening of all patients when they are admitted to hospital, nutrition champions in every NHS board and introducing protected meal times. Scotland was the first country in the UK to make screening for malnutrition a mandatory requirement. The care inspectorate expected all care for older people and support plans detail specific food likes and dislikes. £2 million from 2012 to 2015 to Community Food and Health Scotland to promote healthy eating in the least privileged communities has been made available, improving food access and awareness of nutritional guidelines towards tackling health inequalities. Scotland's National Oral Health Promotion Training and Support Programme, Caring for Smiles to Improve the Oral Health of Older People, particularly those living in care homes, is another initiative we are supporting. Thank you, Margaret Mitchell. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. However, there is a worrying lack of data about older people in Scotland who are malnourished, and in fact, the estimated figure of 100,000 malnourished older people in Scotland comes from projecting UK data. Is the Cabinet Secretary aware that while Age Concern welcomes the must screening initiative to which he referred, it, it is concerned there is no screening of malnourishment of older people in the community, and furthermore, although screening occurs when older patients are admitted to hospital, the 2013 HIS report was critical about the effectiveness of this screening and the limited information about patients' nutritional needs in five hospitals it inspected. Does he consider that there is now a compelling argument for more data on this issue to properly assess and address the problem which is in hospital care homes or involving older people living in the community? Cabinet Secretary. Presenting officer, in terms of the, his report, we're implementing the recommendations. In terms of data, uh, the estimate uh, that we have is something up to 30 per cent of older people admitted to acute hospitals are at risk of malnutrition. Between 30 and 42 per cent admitted to care homes are at risk. 10 to 14 per cent of the 700 of the people in sheltered accommodation may be at risk. 14 per cent of older people are at risk at malnutrition altogether over the population. So we have got a fairly good handle on the scale of the problem, uh, but uh, out with hospital, of course, uh, we need to do more, I agree, to tackle this problem. Uh, and the best way, of course, is to ensure that older people have the necessary income so that they can afford to buy the food they need to sustain themselves. And that's extremely important uh, and why we are very, very supportive uh, of the proposals to improve uh, the pension for older people who many of whom, particularly women, uh, have a very uh, low income indeed and find it difficult sometimes to buy the food, which of course is increasing in price all the time, that they need to stave off malnutrition. Thank you. Question number five, Mike McKenzie. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking to increase community involvement in the pharmacy application process in remote areas. Cabinet Secretary Alec Neal. Presiding officer, I am very pleased to say that I announced on the 30th of May the laying of amended amendment regulations which will ensure there is direct community engagement and participation in the consideration of pharmacy applications. The new regulations will also ensure greater transparency in the decision-making process so that people affected by decisions have a better understanding of how and why those decisions are taken. Mike McKenzie. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. It is becoming increasingly difficult to recruit and retain health professionals in remote areas. What support is the Scottish Government providing to health boards to tackle this issue and support local accessible health services? Cabinet Secretary. 
Presiding officer, I can assure the Chamber the Scottish Government recognises the current challenges in remote and rural areas and is committed to ensuring that all communities in Scotland receive high quality and sustainable health care services. In particular, the Scottish Government continues to promote a range of initiatives to recruit and support GPs working in remote and rural areas. These include proposals for a specific programme of work to be taken forward by NHS Highland to develop and test a range of innovative ways of delivering health care in rural parts of Scotland. This will involve exploring approaches to building sustainable health and care services with all key stakeholders, including local communities. Briefly, Rhoda Grant. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I think we welcome the changes to community involvement in pharmacists and look forward to receiving more of the detail. But can I ask what steps the Cabinet Secretary is going to do to make, to make sure that people in remote rural areas access pharmacy services? Since Guy recently, where Macmillan Boots and NHS Highland are working on a palliative care community pharmacy project which works really well and really underlines the need of pharmacy services, not just to GPs working in rural areas, but their patients as well. Cabinet Secretary. It's, uh, presiding officer, it's primarily the responsibility of each board to ensure that pharmacy services are accessible through every part of their geography. I'm very well aware of the initiatives taken by NHS Highland, which I think will be very successful, and we wish to roll out those initiatives which have been proven to work to other parts of rural Scotland. Thank you. Question number six, Richard Simpson. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what progress the NHS is making in recording and reducing the levels of boarding out. Cabinet Secretary Alex Neil. Presiding Officer, the Scottish Government is leading the way in the UK to tackle boarding. Health boards record and monitor boarding levels on a daily basis, and we've put a range of initiatives to reduce boarding. These include a £30 million unscheduled care programme, the integration of health and social care, our commitment to seven-day working, the development of a bed planning toolkit, and a programme to improve patient flow and reduce boarding and other delays to treatment. However, there is more to be done, and we will continue the work to improve the quality of care in our hospitals. Richard Simpson. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer. Since the boarding out system was introduced, the monitoring of it under Nicola Sturgeon, uh, we have undertaken a freedom of information inquiry. This has shown the number of patients being boarded out between 11 p.m. and 6 a.m. in the morning was 10,500 in 2011-12, 12, 12,712-13, and an estimated 13,000 for the full year last year. If this was not bad enough, these shocking figures are only derived from seven out of 14 health boards. Lothian, Tayside, Glasgow and Clyde, Grampian could not even produce figures for movements at that time. Similarly, we asked about multiple moves and five large health boards, Lothian, Lanarkshire, Greater Glasgow, Tayside and Grampian were unable to say how many multiple moves has occurred. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, is he really satisfied with the management of boarding out when the boards are not even recording the information? And will he issue an instruction now for the boards to comply with recording, including times, and to include a cross-reference to the presence of cognitive impairment, a group which he and I would both agree are least able to cope with boarding out? And will he invite Health Improvement Scotland to make it part of their inspection regime? Cabinet Secretary. The presiding officer, the figures that uh, Dr Simpson quotes relate, I believe he said until last year, he will be aware of the work we've done with the Royal College of Physicians and others, and the very big substantial report that was produced on boarding uh, last year. Uh, I accept there is far too much boarding going on, particularly with people with cognitive problems, and the whole purpose of that report and its recommendations, which we're now implementing, is to improve the situation, both in terms of recording, but most importantly, to reduce the need for for boarding in the first place, and I'll certainly take on board the additional suggestions that Dr Simpson has made. Many thanks. Question number seven, Gordon MacDonald. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking to tackle health inequalities in the most deprived communities. Minister Michael Matheson. As a government, we have been clear that health inequalities in our most deprived communities cannot be solved by health solutions alone. The interventions which are most likely to reduce health inequalities are those which utilise taxation, legislation, regulation and changes in the broader distribution of income and power. 
We have demonstrated our commitment to this approach with measures such as free prescriptions, free eye examinations, expanding free school meals and the provision of childcare and our work on youth employment. We will continue to take forward a range of policies that will assist in tackling health inequalities in partnership with our colleagues within the NHS, local authorities and third sector. Gordon MacDonald. I thank the Minister for that answer. Um, I, I read in the press recently about a pilot scheme referring to a GP link worker who can help people to deal with financial, emotional or environmental problems as a result of housing, debt, social isolation, stress or fuel poverty issues. Can the Minister provide more details of that pilot scheme? Minister. Uh, the pilot scheme which the member makes uh, uh, reference to was uh, uh, launched by the Cabinet Secretary just in the uh, last few weeks, which is a, a partnership that has been developed with uh, uh, several of the deep end practices. It is a pilot project that will see a, a link worker uh, being placed within seven uh, of these uh, practices uh, in Glasgow and in, in Dundee uh, with a number of comparator, uh, eight comparator uh, practices to evaluate the effectiveness of the, the link worker. Their purpose uh, will be to look at what support they can provide to uh, patients that are referred to them by GPs. It can be relating to housing, finance uh, or other environmental uh, issues. And this is a, a pilot which we have worked with the deep end practices on uh, developing and taking forward and it will be evaluated um, over the next couple of years. The initial intention was that that programme would be for a, a two-year pilot. However, following discussion with the uh, deep end practices themselves, uh, we have agreed to extend that to five years. Uh, and what we will do is take the learning from that as we go forward over the next five years to see how we can then extend that out to other practices in deprived areas. Thank you. Question number eight, Aileen MacLeod. Uh, thank you, presenting officer. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what action is taking to help young people with cancer access clinical trials. Cabinet Secretary Alex Neil. Presenting officer, the Chief Scientist Office of the Scottish Government funds several research networks, of which two, the Scottish Cancer Research Network and the Scottish Children's Research Network, operate to enhance access for children and young people with cancer into clinical trials. CSO has entered into discussion with these two research networks to ensure that they work closely to provide support to patients in this transitional age range to take part in clinical research. Aileen McLeod. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer. Given the importance of accessing clinical trials and helping to treat young people with cancer, can the Cabinet Secretary advise what progress is being made with the recruitment of a new cancer clinical research champion, when he expects the announcement of such a new champion to be made, and how this champion will tackle the inequity of access for young people into clinical trials? Cabinet Secretary. Presiding officer, I'm pleased to be able to tell the member and the chamber that after a competitive recruitment process, Professor David Cameron, no relation, I don't think, to another David Cameron of Edinburgh University has been appointed as the new Scottish Cancer Research Champion and a formal announcement will be made in the near future. In its early discussion with Professor Cameron, the Chief Scientist's Office will ask him to look into the issue of access to trials for young people with cancer and to obtain reliable data. Thank you. Question number nine, Chick Brody. Thank you. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government when it will review the standard mortality rates at Air Hospital. Cabinet Secretary Alec Neal. Presiding Officer, HSMR figures for all acute hospitals in Scotland, including University Hospital Air, are routinely considered on a quarterly basis, and the next figures will be published in August 2014. The latest data available to the quarter ended December 2013 indicated that there was a national reduction of 14.2% in hospital standardised mortality ratios in Scotland since recording such data began in the quarter ended December 2007. The data for Air Hospital indicated a higher single data point on this quarter's analysis, and while HSMR cannot be used in isolation as a marker of quality and safety of care, it can be used as a smoke alarm to trigger further evaluation. As a result, NHS Ayrshire and Arm are already undertaking further investigation of this data point, and Healthcare Improvement Scotland are engaged in a supportive process of dialogue and interaction with the board. Healthcare Improvement Scotland and the Scottish Government will continue to work with NHS Ayrshire and Arm to ensure that their HSMR continues to fall in accordance with the national trend. Chick Brody. Uh, thank you. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his very comprehensive answer. Against a background where standard mortality rates across Scotland have, as he said, dropped by 14% since 2007, it's regrettable. 
that Air Hospital in the last recorded quarter was above the national average. They should not hide the fact, however, that Air Hospital and its staff have a good longer-term record in reducing standard mortality rates. Despite what has been a serious economic recession, specific problems like increased methadone deaths and deaths as a consequence, consequence of social issues like energy poverty are being addressed, but would ask that the government ensures the hospital continues its drive to improve the appropriate standards of quality of care that reduces the levels of mortality. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding officer, the Scottish Government expects all health boards as part of the Scottish Patient Safety Programme to implement measures to prevent avoidable harm and deaths. The Scottish Government is committed to further improving the safety of health care and expects NHS Ayrshire and Arm continue improving the quality and safety of care for the population it serves and I will be keeping a very close eye on it to make sure that it does. Many thanks. A supplementary from John Scott. Many thanks, Deputy Presiding Officer. The Cabinet Secretary is aware of the shortage of available beds at Air Hospital, which may or may not have influenced the standard mortality rates. Can the Cabinet Secretary tell Parliament what can be done to better manage bed availability at Air Hospital, which is key also to reducing A&E waiting times? Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, there are two specific areas that uh, affect the issue of beds in Air Hospital. One is delayed discharges, although South Ayrshire is, relatively speaking, by far not one of the worst authorities in terms of dealing with delayed discharges. But secondly, the flow of patients during the day is uh, still too high a percentage of patients who are being discharged each day are just discharged fairly late in the day uh, for no good reason, quite frankly. And a key part of implementing an unscheduled care plan for all hospitals, including AIR, is to improve dramatically the percentage of patients who are discharged before lunchtime as they are medically fit for discharge and it's appropriate to free up the beds for those people who are coming in through the A&E department and indeed through GP referrals. Thank you. Question number 10, Patricia Ferguson. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met the NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde Board. Cabinet Secretary Alex Neil. Presiding Officer, both Ministers and Government officials regularly meet representatives of NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde to discuss matters of interest to the people of Greater Glasgow and Clyde. Thank you. Patricia Ferguson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As the Cabinet Secretary is aware, patients in North and North East Glasgow and beyond who require chemotherapy more often than not have to make their way to the Beetson Centre to receive such treatment. This is often not a very easy journey, particularly by public transport, and is an additional difficulty for people who are perhaps already unwell. Can the Cabinet Secretary indicate if he has discussed with NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde the possibility of chemotherapy being provided at Stop Hill Hospital, saving the patients involved a great deal of stress and anxiety? Cabinet Secretary. Presenting officer, I'm very, very well aware of this issue and I've been in touch with many of the people from north of the river who are very keen to establish these services at Stop Hill. I have actually studied both the information provided by Greater Glasgow and Clyde as well as by those people campaigning for this change. And I have to say that I think that Greater Glasgow and Clyde are taking the right decision in this matter, but I am happy to share the information with the member and indeed I'm happy to meet with the member eh, along with representatives of Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board so that we can discuss the issue in detail because it is a very, very detailed issue in terms of the statistics about the postal code areas where people come from for such treatment. Many thanks. Supplementary from Jackson Carlow. I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary could confirm as a result of his discussions with the Health Board what arrangements or contingencies they have made to cope with a large international presence in the city during the Commonwealth Games and how they intend to ensure that those attending uh, have access to information should the need arise. Cabinet Secretary. A can I say to the member that the health service, like all other essential public services, have been part of the resilience planning for the Commonwealth Games. And the health board has played a very full part, along with the organising committee for the Games, with Glasgow City Council and with a range of other bodies, to make sure we have in place all contingencies and arrangements to meet all contingencies during the Commonwealth Games. And I'm happy to write to the member with more detail of those, although for obvious reasons I can't always give them too much information because some of it, by the very nature, has to remain confidential. Many thanks. Question number 11, John Wilson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what measures are being taken to improve early identification and diagnosis of children with asthma. Minister Michael Matheson. 
Uh, the Scottish Government is committed to providing the best quality of care and treatment for people with uh, and living with uh, asthma in Scotland. Health Improvement Scotland published last year asthma priorities influencing the agenda. Uh, this includes the early and accurate diagnosis of asthma in children. John Wilson. Can I thank the Cabinet the Minister for his response? Can I further ask the Minister what work is being undertaken with GPs regarding to the issue of asthma and referrals to specialist asthma services? And what is the availability of asthma treatments, particularly looking at the development of new treatments for young children, especially for those children under the age of four? Minister. Well, the member will be uh, aware that there was a recently published a National Review of Asthma Deaths, which looked at the way in which asthma services were being delivered uh, in, uh, across the whole of the UK, including here uh, in Scotland. And there's a range of recommendations contained within that particular report. There are key aspects in terms of the way in which uh, services are delivered at a primary care level. So, for example, there's the issue about making sure there's regular reviews undertaken of a patient uh, who has been diagnosed with asthma and making sure that they're encouraged to participate in that review as well. There's also about making sure that they're receiving the appropriate preventative uh, medication as and when appropriate and that it's been used appropriate, uh, appropriately. And what's now happening is that given the recommendations that have been contained within this report, the, uh, the, uh, the National uh, Advisory Group on Respiratory uh, Managed Clinical Networks is considering all of the detail of these recommendations to consider what actions we need to take in Scotland in order to improve services yet further. With regards to uh, specific uh, treatments as well, I'm sure the member will appreciate the nature and type of treatment that uh, a patient is prescribed is a clinical uh, decision, and we would expect, whether it be general practitioners or uh, clinicians within the secondary care setting, to make sure that uh, particularly children who require a particular form of treatment for their asthma, that that is uh, provided to them timely and in an appropriate way. Very briefly, Richard Simpson. Can I thank the Minister for his response and for his addressing the asthma deaths problem. I wonder if what he's doing in terms of the recommendation to look at those, pa uh, those patients who are prescribed more than 12 reliever um, inhalers in a year, because these are the ones where they reckon there are higher levels of deaths. So what monitoring and uh, system is he putting in place to ensure that these people are picked up quickly and are reviewed? Minister. So I recognise the point that the member is making, and that's why the National Advisory Group on Respiratory Managed Clinical Networks is considering these recommendations in particular. Once we have received their report and their recommendations on what measures should be taken forward, including aspects of monitoring, if that's what they recommend, we will then consider how that can be rolled out on a national basis. But there is an issue about making sure there's a greater consistency of approach in the way in which we are uh, managing conditions like asthma. Uh, and I think the uh, National Review provides us with very helpful information on how we can achieve that more effectively. Thank you. Question 12, Marco Biaggi. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the health impact of over-provision of licensed premises in urban areas. Michael Matheson. Uh, the provision or over-provision of licensed premises within a local area is a matter for local licensing boards to consider. One of the grounds for refusal of a premises licence is that the granting of it would result in over-provision, having regard to the number and capacity of existing premises. In assessing the extent of any over-provision in a locality, the board must consult relevant interests, including the police and the local health board. Marco Biaggi. I thank the Minister for that answer. In central Edinburgh, there is an outstanding planning application for a 900-seat uh, super pub currently under appeal. One chain is looking at converting three properties into large new pubs. And last month, two new supermarkets were controversially licensed against the advice of NHS Lothian and the police. What advice would uh, the Minister give to local authorities and licensing boards in how they should weigh up the advice they receive from health and uh, law and order interests against uh, other interests to ensure that we actually can tackle this problem of over-provision and uh, over-consumption of alcohol, especially in city centres? Minister. Well, there is a very well-established evidence that demonstrates that availability is a key factor in driving uh, alcohol consumption uh, overall, and that uh, it's a type of factor which uh, boards should be taken into account uh, when they are submitting their evidence to licensing boards uh, and their view on the potential health impact uh, that uh, any further provision of licensed premises could uh, have. Of course, the member will appreciate that it is a matter for the local licensing board to 
all to make a decision on this matter. Uh, but I would encourage boards, uh, licensing boards, to make sure they do consider in detail uh, the responses which they receive from their colleagues within uh, individual local health boards and to consider that in any decision making they're making around uh, the provision or the over provision uh, of licensed premises within their local authority area. Question number 13, James Dornan. To ask the Scottish Government how unpaid carers could be supported by the findings of the expert working group on welfare. Minister Michael Matheson. Uh, the Scottish Government currently provides significant support to unpaid carers, underpinned by considerable investment of nearly £114 million since 2007 within its existing pools. The expert working group on welfare is clear uh, that with independence we can go further in supporting this vital sector. We have already committed to raising carers allowance to the rate of job seekers allowance if we are the Government in an independent Scotland, as recommended by the group. The report outlines some of the longer-term measures to support unpaid carers, addressing disincentives to work and caring in the benefit system and in the workplace, and tackling the current rules limiting its study and receiving carers' allowance. As the First Minister said in the Chamber last week, the Government will take forward and consider fully the recommendations of the expert working group. James Dornan. I thank the Minister for that answer. Having recently met with a representative of the Scottish Youth Parliament, to discuss their Care Fair Share campaign, it is clear that those issues that the working group outlined as affecting carers, such as low income and variable levels of support, are also challenges that can face young carers. Has the Scottish Government looked at any additional assistance for young carers, for example, in the area of education maintenance allowances? Minister. Uh, I am aware of the uh, report uh, that came from the, uh, the uh, uh, the Youth Parliament in Scotland regarding this particular issue. There is a range of work that we have taken forward, particularly in the area of education, to try and help to support uh, young carers to be able to remain in education, because it is important they are able to do so, whether that be in the primary uh, setting or the secondary setting or the, uh, the higher and further education uh, setting. We have also taken forward work with uh, college development, the College Development Network to look at what policies individual colleges can put in place to help to support uh, young carers in their education. And we also recently issued new guidance around education maintenance allowances uh, in order to make sure that the needs of young carers are accommodated in the way in which colleges uh, assess EMAs. So these combination of measures, I believe, can help to support young carers within the education setting. But there's clearly more we can do, and we're considering what further measures can be taken forward with carers' legislation in the coming years. Question 14, John Mason. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on prescribing homeopathic medicines. Cabinet Secretary Alec Neil. Presenting officer, the strategic direction and funding for healthcare in Scotland is set by the Scottish Government. Decisions on the allocation of funding to provide access to services, including complementary and alternative therapies, is a matter for the individual health boards based on the needs of the local populations and in line with national guidance. The prescription of specific treatments is a clinical decision for practitioners. John Mason. Is it becoming more difficult to get homeopathic medicines? Cabinet Secretary. Well, obviously, a number of boards have carried out a review. There's one going on in Lanarkshire at the moment, and Lothian, I believe, has carried out one recently as well. So, uh, clearly, in different parts of the country, uh, there are different approaches to the availability of homeopathic medicines. Can I say sometimes there's a confusion between access to homeopathic medicine and access to the services of the Centre for Integrated Healthcare in Gartnavel in Glasgow. The Centre for Integrated Care provides a much wider range of services, very effective and efficacious services, uh, than uh, just homeopathic, although it is referred to very often as the Glasgow Homeopathic Hospital. It actually provides many, many other services uh, of a holistic nature uh, and not just homeopathy. So I would make that distinction in answering the member and uh, bring to the attention of the Chamber the excellent provision of services by the centre. Many thanks. Question number 15, Drew Smith. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish mm -hmm. Government what secondary uh, dental treatment for oral cancer is provided without charge by the National Health Service in Scotland. Minister Michael Matheson. Uh, all dental treatment for oral cancer should be provided free of charge, whether a patient is referred to, uh, where a patient is referred to hospital dental services. Uh, the care should be provided as part of a consultant-led medical treatment plan. It should also uh, be the case that failure to provide the care would impact detrimentally on the patient's medical condition or prospect for recovery. 
on discharge and once the oral cancer team are content, the surgery and treatment has been completed, the patient's condition is now stable, then the patient would be returned to the care of their dentist. Drew Smith. Um, can I thank the Minister very much um, for that answer. Um, I was actually made aware by a member of the public um, who uh, told me that he was uh, fundraising for an individual who um, had been told that he needed to have uh, dental, dental extractions which were not covered, although um, he'd also been advised that they were required as um, part of his treatment. So I, I'm very grateful to him for uh, uh, setting that out. Uh, although the individual is not my um, constituent, I'm not pursuing it through casework, I'm grateful for him. Is he confident that that, that, that information, uh, 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 that that guidance is being followed by every board in Scotland? Minister. Well, there obviously there are different stages in the, uh, the course of treatment any patient may require uh, if they have been identified as having oral cancer. If the member is referring to some uh, pre-operative work that may be required, uh, including dental extractions as part of that process, then that would be part of the consultant-led medical treatment provision as part of the treatment plan for that patient. Then if it's been provided by the public dental services, uh, then it would be free of charge. But if the uh, member has a, a specific details that he wants to uh, provide me with, I'm more than happy to make sure that that's thoroughly investigated because uh, any patient who is receiving uh, uh, medically-led treatment for uh, oral cancer should receive their dental uh, treatment free of charge. Thank you, Minister. That concludes questions and brings us to the next item of business. I will allow a few seconds for members to change places. <laughs>